finally somebody on the committee, but who is not actually.
Monday was my last Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, very good. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our annual Dr. William and Marjorie Searage Lecture. I'm going to start with just some brief remarks. So many of you have heard me say this before, but when the medical school opened our doors in 1971, and uh, I joined the second class of students coming in of the AMD program right out of uh, high school, uh, I met Dr. Marjorie Searage for the very first time. She was my docent, which is a mentor and advisor, and uh, she, from the very beginning, emphasized the humanities for us, not only uh, as we cared for patients, but as we fulfilled other obligations uh, within a school of medicine, and that included being educators and being researchers. So when she established in 1992 the Office of Medical Humanities, it was a one-of-a-kind program because she actually operationalized what we had felt from her for that first 20 years. And in 1995, with a grant from the Culpeper Foundation, Dr. Bill A. and Dr. Marjorie moved forward their plan to develop an undergraduate medical humanities curriculum at UMKC. In 2008, the Office of Medical Humanities and Bioethics was renamed to further promote the mission of integrating the arts, humanities, and bioethics into the study and practice of medicine. And that has been woven through not only our six-year program, but of course we now have about a third of our students coming through a traditional four-year track. Uh, we then also had the first endowed professor at that time who was appointed uh, in, in that same time frame. So while I never had the honor of being taught by Dr. Bill, Dr. Marjorie was one of my first docents. And seeing her as a wife, a mother, a teacher, a mentor, and dedicated physician allowed me to envision how I'd weave my roles as a daughter, sister, wife, and eventually a mother and grandmother into my professional career as a clinician, an educator, and a researcher. And I'm a pediatric ID doctor, so when I took on the role of a, uh, the dean at the School of Medicine in 2018, never did I anticipate that a pandemic would follow me, uh, but it did indeed. And it actually gave me some added uh, opportunity to use my expertise as we navigated those challenges here. At a recent School of Medicine event, when I was asked about the roadmap uh, to leadership in medicine, I commented that thriving and surviving depended on a number of factors. But it started with having a personal mission and vision that focused on what you had passion for. Both of the Dr. Searages had that passionate vision for weaving the humanities into clinical medicine into medical education, and they were both trailblazers and advocates. And their vision met, benefited not only their patients, but allowed them to be effective men mentors and uh, obviously to serve as role models to all of us. They were at the heart of the School of Medicine in our early days, and they had a lasting legacy that will never be forgotten. Uh, Dr. Marjorie, who joined the School of Medicine as its founding, I said in 1971 as the original docent, uh, when we lost her, it was quite unexpected to me. I had just visited with her um, ab about two months prior, and uh, at that time, I went to her with a very specific uh, concern that I had, where I was hoping for uh, her insight to move something forward within the school. And this was before, uh, you know, I was even uh, the dean at the School of Medicine. And she gave of herself, of her time, and she gave me some pretty solid advice, I will tell you. Uh, 
Our first Dean, Richardson K. Novak, is uh, just turned 99. I visited with him on Friday, and uh, he lives at a retirement community in our, uh, in our city. He retired in 1993, but he's really stayed very active. And he and I were reminiscing uh, about the series and about the early days of the School of Medicine. And I, I can tell you that uh, not only we, but he keeps their memory uh, alive. Um, I think that one of the most important things that both of them brought is their ability to expect the best out of everyone while keeping an abundant drive and stamina that let them perform. And I heard this uh, phrase used for Dr. Marjorie. I think it certainly applied uh, for both of them, but with effortless excellence. And that is indeed how I identified always with her. So it's my honor to recognize the dedication, compassion, and promise to that this lectureship uh, represents. And now it's my honor to bring uh, Dr. Brian Carter, the endowed Searage Professor and Chair of the Department of Humanities and Bioethics, to the podium to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Jackson, and thank you, Searage family, uh, over and over again. I, uh, in my office upstairs, have a picture. It's not this picture. Uh, but a picture of Bill and Marjorie as a reminder what's expected, how can I honor their legacy and their vision. And in that vein, uh, this lectureship is presenting today uh, esteemed professor, family physician, humanitarian, bioethicist, and friend, uh, Dr. David Dukas, uh, from Tulane. David John Dukas is the James A. Knight Chair in Humanities and Ethics and Medicine and a Professor of Family and Community Medicine at Tulane University Medical School, where he directs the program in Human Values and is the Executive Director of the Master of Science in Bioethics and Medical Humanities Program. He also serves as the Integrated Ethics Program Officer at the Southeast Louisiana Veterans in New Orleans, as well as a regional, what's called VISIN 16 Clinical Ethics Liaison. He served as the founding president of the Academy for Professionalism in Healthcare, uh, which is an organization in Society for Bioethics and Humanities uh, with its intent to elevate uh, education and uh, direction in professionalism as well as the humanities in medical education and actually across disciplines. Uh, so the organization is. Dr. Dukas uh, was a graduate in, oh gosh, a long time ago. <laughs> Uh, he and I graduated college the same year and medical school the same year, 1979 from UVA uh, and 1983 from Georgetown School of Medicine. He then took his family medicine uh, residency uh, in Kentucky and following that did a year as a fellow at Georgetown uh, University's uh, School of, excuse me, Center for, for bioethics. And uh, that year, in one sense, that added fellowship gave him perspective and uh, insights as well as a, a corpus of knowledge and experience that I think has stuck with David uh, even to this very day. We chatted about that some yesterday. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our uh, Searage lecturer, Dr. David Dukas, who will be speaking on promoting professionalism transformation via the humanities. David? Thank you, Dr. Carter, for the kind introduction. And thank you to the entire Searage family and to your parents for the lectureship and the program in your name. 
uh, I ha hold a particular um, esteem for those who uh, invest in education um, in a similar way many years ago when my uh, brother was struck down from an auto accident. Um, I had instigated within my family a desire to set up a scholarship in my brother's name at the law school where he graduated from. And when my uh, parents recently passed, we added to that endowment to, to help sustain that. And from time to time over the years, I will see people put Gregory Emanuel Dukas scholarship recipient on their CVs and I'll send, send them an email and just say, let me tell you a little bit about my brother. So thank you so much. So I'm here to talk about promoting professionalism and how we can conduct that transformation with the humanities. I am required to say that this does not represent the views of the Veterans Administration nor of the United States government. Otherwise, I have no conflicts. So these are my object objectives today. Talk about what's being done, how it is being currently evaluated at professionalism in terms of uh, to other realms and to engage in discussion on how to pro improve professionalism. Excellence is an art won by training and habituation. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have those because we have acted rightly. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. This is part of the reason I guess I'm a fan as a family physician, and I've done training in a form of uh, cognitive behavior therapy called rational behavior therapy. So you look at what are your beliefs and what are your actions and how do these have a chain or causal relationship. Professionalism as sort of a, let's get around a common definition, is a foundational concept grounded on knowledge and skills, expectations we have of any person in medicine promoting patient inf uh, benefit, that's the primary goal, while rejecting self-interest and sustained by a covenant of trust with society. Then the medical education goal for deans and associate deans and program officers is we have to have a curriculum that teaches medical learners how to integrate what their role is as a scientist with the application of medical ethics and humanities to promote patient welfare. Now, several colleagues of mine and I put forward a series of articles beginning in 2010 having to do with Abraham Flexner. Many people get really upset about Abraham Flexner and the Flexner Report. That's not what I'm here to talk about. There are lots of things that went wrong in the Flexner Report. One of the things he did do was say, you need a scientific basis upon which to see patients, then back it up with clinical experience so that you have an understanding of what it is to interact with those patients. Unfortunately, back in the battle days, pre-Flexner Report, people used to learn OB by studying mannequins. And they would never lay a hand on a pregnant woman or a delivery of a child, as a for instance, until they went out into their apprenticeship post-medical school. Regardless, when I did this survey of Flexner's work, I found recent, uh, reason to go far beyond the Flexner Report. There was a dearth of information having to do with ethics and professionalism at all in the Flexner Report. But then writings, writings outside of Flexner. He had many writings on college education, even high school education, but very importantly on medical education that were written 15 years after the Flexner Report, when he bemoans how the Flexner Report was ill-used by medicine in terms of the education of students. 
So we designed a curriculum that was a Flexner-inspired solution because the predicate of what Flexner expected was anyone coming into medical school had gone through a liberal arts education prior to medical school. They already had art and ethics and history and literature prior to their entry. That's not necessarily the case nowadays. We tend to have students who are biology majors or chemistry majors or neuro, uh, what, um, you know, things such as um, uh, other, other chemistry, physics, other things like that. And what we decided was we needed to then look at how there could be these emphases placed into the medical curriculum of undergraduate medical education in medical school. And that laid the foundation for the series of papers that we wrote in the PRIME project, or the project to rebalance and integrate medical education. So our argument was this. We need to train learners in ethical argument and analysis, in reflective narrative, in observational skills and fine art, and in history regarding art of medicine. And further, to enhance mentorship and role modeling akin to a medical professorship, apprenticeship. Attitudes, behaviors, and interpersonal skills. The upper part had to do with knowledge, the lower part having to do with skills. Yet there was trouble in paradise. This is taken from our own professionalism program. It's called the TRIO. So when there are aberrancies of behavior, we get an email, which is de-identified. But it will talk about what the offense is, as cited by medical student, resident, staff, or faculty member. So as you can see, there are times when people have challenges. They ranted, they berated, they cursed, they were abusive, they were condescending, they were bullying, there was alcohol use with suicidal thoughts, posted information on social media, touched a patient inappropriately. And you just go, oh. I mean, when I get these, I will get a cascade of these on the pretty much a daily basis. And the trio, there are five of us, and it takes three of us to make a decision on how to proceed within our protocol, which is grounded in the Vanderbilt uh, professionalism pyramid model. Gerald Hickson is the person I would recommend you read up on. So my concern when I came into this program was we can't just be playing professionalism whack-a-mole, where we're just patting down on the people who are misbehaving. There's something very wrong here. And how professionalism is dealt with, particularly with the negative outliers, is usually a peer-reviewed process. So that could be the dean's level or chief of staff level if we're talking about a hospital. But then also through these critical response entities address this negative conduct. So when I came in as a member of the TRIO, I said, I'll do this if. One of my first ifs was, we have to not only follow up on these negative outliers, we need a way of recognizing our positive outliers. We need to publicly proclaim, here is a person who has done good, and here is why. educational program to sustain professionalism institutionally for all learners. We can't just focus on the negative because, you know, if we have a system that isn't working and we have those kinds of quotes that you saw and we're not doing the follow-up education, who's failing who? We need to proclaim those positive role models, but we also need to teach what it means 
to have professionalism formation. And because otherwise, we're just doing this whipping boy exercise for the negative outliers. The other thing, too, is, and this happens in medical school, happens in residency, and happens at the attending level, backgrounds vary, culture vary, emotional intelligence varies. And so we do have select institutions such as this one, with ex excellent professionalism education because they have sound curricula in medical ethics and humanities and role modeling, but they're the exception, not the rule. And we can't be surprised when we have these kinds of outliers when professionalism and role modeling to begin with. So, and I'm appealing way outside of this audience to all audiences because my role at, at uh, Academy for Professionalism in Healthcare, as I was president for seven years, and we not only draw on a national audience, but actually an international audience. We have people from Canada, from Israel, and from Brazil who are regular members. What we need to do is have a reordering of the assigned mandate. And we need to have a recognition that professionalism is flawed if the aspirational nature of professionalism is not set as the primary goal in professionalism education. And we're going to tie that into virtue in a second because aspirational is really the name of the game with virtue. So we need to reactively approach the negative outliers, and responsibly and publicly to the positive outliers, and proactively with a longitudinal curriculum for students, residents, and faculty. Because again, everyone came from different places. We can't assume that since we're teaching X, all of the teachers have received that teaching and that we address ethics and humanities-based knowledge that will nurture professionalism and promote mentorship and role modeling. Well, let's look at UMKC. Look, we do have a reactive means by which to address unprofessional behavior. There's a reporting mechanism and how that should be reported and to what office. Um, it doesn't actually give the whole protocol. We actually, in our TRIO thing, we have a box of every type of infraction and where it'll, if it's a Cleary violation, it goes here. And if it's this, it goes there. So, but this is at least saying, if you see a problem, you need to say something about the problem. So that's reactive. It's responsive. So the Project P, or also Project P, because you are projecting professionalism, empathy, and kindness, Wall's web page, and it has um, video vignettes and stories about people who did behavior, and then also you're proactive. You have a Department of Medical Humanities and bioethics, again, something to be applauded. This is rarity in medical school. You are to be applauded because many schools don't have this at all, okay? And you have a large palette of medical humanities courses and experiences and role modeling that then oversees the professional identity formation for all your learners. So what am I doing here? Am I carrying coals to Newcastle? I.e., bringing stuff to people who already got it. And as you know on the internet, you can always find a slide for anything. It's no use carrying coals to Newcastle. I would say, you got to love the internet. You know? That was one of the, the images that came up. I said, got to use it. And so 
I would say there is a use to carrying coals to Newcastle because we then are validating each other's commitment to professionalism education. And in so doing, we can also say, and this is part of the virtue ethics thing, we're all imperfect. We can all improve. We can all aspire to even better. There is no such thing as 100%. We're always working towards a better person, a better professional. So we can aspire to have the highest uh, character. Excellent health. That means the same thing in inspiring all of our learners. And we can seek peers and mentors that can promote moral growth. Well, what if we just change our input? Why can't we just get, like, you know, like the NFL draft? Just get, re I know that's kind of big around here because of you all. <laughs> I heard that last night at dinner. So why don't we just get great paradigms of virtue Problem gone. We don't have to worry about this. Doesn't quite work like that. There's a lot of variability in life. Different people have learned different things, and health providers must teach their peers and their learners professionalism because it's not just about autonomy, beneficence, and justice. It's also about, as Brian knows, about virtue and care ethics. It's hard enough for most schools that don't have a humanities program or department to just do the fundamentals of the deontology. And they really don't have the time or the direction to point them towards virtue and care ethics. So professionalism is integral to our development. We got that. AMCs need to nurture it, got that too. And it's better for AMCs to track and redress those shortcomings than the state board, because that's where oftentimes things got sorted out. The stories that I heard, particularly when I was chair of the ethics committee up at the University of Louisville, it was things like, oh, well, we caught this doc who was selling back detail medicines he got for free to the pharmacist because he got them for free. He got them for a profit. DEA nailed him. He lost his medical license and lost his DEA license. And he even said afterwards, I didn't even need the money. But why did you do it? What was the lure? What was the siren song? So it's better to address these things so that people don't go ahead and have these conflicts of interest and ethical behavior to then land them into ethical hot water. So that means we need to concentrate on virtue and character, repetition, okay? So that means we do things in certain ways, and that means we have to have virtuous action coming from a virtuous character. You think, oh, but that's circular. Not really, because it has to do with the people that you're with. The Greeks, I'm Hellenic American, both sides of my family. First saying I was ever introduced to in my family had to do with friends and lovers, and that is you become like the one you sit with. You become like the one you sit with. So that also holds in education or in a relationship with a mentor as an apprentice. You become like what you see and interact with, okay? And when you see someone acting virtuously, you too wish to act in that way. So this is an area of ethics that has its roots in age which means excellence. The famous quote is, it is the greatest good for a man to discuss virtue all day on the grounds that the unexamined life is not worth living. And virtue is supposed to be a kind of knowledge identified with wisdom, or one of my favorite Greek words, sophia, 
wisdom is both necessary and sufficient for virtue. An analogy is, is that a skilled athlete or a musician or a surgeon physically changes his or her body through repetitious actions. Again and again and again and again, the virtuous person will find it easier to act virtuously. She changes her physical and emotional characteristics with repetition. Here are some of the clinical virtues of note. This is drawn from um, Ed Pellegrino's and David Thomas's book on virtue ethics. Compassion, fidelity to trust, fortitude, integrity, justice, phronesis, or practical wisdom, self-effacement, and temperance. Good habits formed at youth make all the difference. So Pellegrino and Thomasma argued for a need to incorporate virtue ethics into medical education. They did this 30 years ago. Um, they also believed that it was helpful to mesh it with principalism. And in an interesting turn of events, uh, Beecham and Childress's book on biomedical ethics actually did kind of backdoor in virtue ethics into their book. Backdoor meaning a little bit of, wouldn't it be good if you were virtuous too? It did not raise the playing field to be even. It was kind of a, a divot. And so um, there has never really been this recognition in medical education of where virtue ethics was necessarily part of what it is to be professional. And then you add Fred Hafferty. Fred's a dear friend of mine at Mayo who wrote about the hidden curriculum now many times. Um, basically, we can go ahead and say what is right and wrong all day long in years one through two or years one through for, but as soon as they hit the wards as a clerk or as an intern, they're going to hear things like, look, I know you were told to do this, but what we do is that. The most striking example is for a at real live attending physician and a real case, I once got a STAT 911 go. <coughs> And it was from one of my colleagues because this patient had had a motor vehicle accident, was bleeding out, and the doctor called me saying, the surgeon is about to operate on this patient whom we know is Jehovah's Witness. It had been conveyed either by the patient before passing out or from family. I don't know how it was conveyed originally. I said, Stuart, stop. First, can you get access to his wallet? Yes. What does his wallet say? It should have a card in there stating he's Jehovah's Witness. Yes, it says I'm Jehovah's Witness. I refuse all transfusions, even if my life depends upon it. I said, you need to tell that doctor. He said, yeah, he's ready to hang the blood right now. I said, you need to tell the doctor that if he does that, he is committing an act of assault and battery upon the patient. He is violating civil law in that he is now forcing a therapy that the patient and the patient's family are telling him to not institute. And in so doing, he will be open for malpractice as well as any array of lawsuits that they wish. And guess what? Because this is violative of the actual policy on Jehovah's Witness refusal of treatment at the University of Louisville Hospital. I knew this because I was the chair of the ethics committee. I said he will be entirely unshielded from any prosecution and any litigation. And there was a long pause, and I said, Stuart, what's happening? He's putting away. Now, this was a 
doctor who had been doing this for a few years. I know what's right. I'm going to do it, even though this patient has already said through an advance directive, the card, I don't want it. What virtue ethics teaches us is how to behave in those moments of strife and sorrow and peril. And so that coupled with the fact that ACGME requires professionalism and there's a whole nother riff that I could do for about 20 or 30 slides on the verbiage of virtue ethics and care ethics that is woven through all six of the general competencies and with parallels in LCME, AACME, and uh, Joint Commission requirements. So I decided to do a scoping review project for the Arnold P. Gold Foundation that Brian was part of. And so what we were trying to do was a thematic construct of what are the main themes having to do with the aspirational but also detracting aspects of professionalism in education and practice. And we looked for three different types of things that they had to have in there in some way, shape, or form. Normative argument for virtue and or care ethics, a curriculum evaluated that improved humanism, and a linkage to humanism in actual clinical care. And it looked like this, big bubbles and squares. So we first did a PubMed search. We then looked through all these other databases. We were able to come up with 766 papers, and then we filtered them, and we found 25 papers. Not a whole lot has been done here. And in actuality, of those 25, only eight stuck it, meaning they did a clean 10 out of 10 Olympics landing on having those three. On the other 17, they were kind of wobbly on the descent. They didn't quite have everything. They didn't quite have the fully composed curriculum, or they didn't have the linkage to humanism. But we were then able to come up with a series of themes, metaphors, and concepts. I'm not going to linger on this uh, slide, except to note, I'm told up. Oh, I need to go back. I can use this. If you know most written on are the development of virtuous traits and the actual praxis or ethical behavior that is resultant. And I'd love to get rid of that thing. Okay. And then dissonance between virtue and principle-based ethics. Now, you'll notice there are a variety of other themes. The next slide will talk more about that. But we also had side issues. One was professionalism. Because the aim in our, um, uh, uh, of this project was looking at humanism. It's the Arnold P. Humanism Foundation, not the Professionalism Foundation. But there was a very large amount of overlap between the papers talking about professionalism and humanistic portrayal through behavior. So this is sort of a more of an um, operationalized way of looking at these various um, themes. So as a learner comes in, they are then exposed to a variety of virtues, and those are being developed and or otherwise role modeled, altruism being a primary concern in terms of the care of patients, as well as care ethics. And these are being um, opposed by a virtue principalism dissonance, meaning there are times when what deontology and virtue ethics are saying leave the learner confused. That there are clinical factors of pedagogy and role modeling. How does it get taught on the wards? And then again, you have the culture slash hidden curriculum challenges that oppose it. And then ultimately, we're aiming for praxis, or how does somebody behave professionally with the noteworthy considerations on the side there. And this is the actual um, public 
education citation if you're interested. It's in BMC Medical Education if you're interested. So it's not just about rules. Uh, back in the olden days, back in 1979, when I first entered medical school, we were taught by the Kennedy Institute faculty at Georgetown autonomy, beneficence, and justice. And it was sort of beaten into it. I found out after I left Georgetown, everyone else called it the, the Georgetown mantra, uh, which was a pejorative slight. But nonetheless, um, it was something that was drilled into us. However, there were people like Warren Reich, who was one of my mentors, who spoke early about virtue ethics. And the other person who became one of my mentors for my fellowship uh, four years later, Edmund Pellegrino, who wrote about virtue ethics. And so we're, we need to be looking at the character of the moral agents and address the gaps. How should we be matters, because that's the way to become a better person, but also a better healer who knows how to do the right thing. So here are some take-home points having to do with what that particular study taught me. Programs generally need some form of guidance and structure on how to enhance professionalism and professional conduct. That means we need some sort of a framework because there hasn't been one proffered. And so from this data, three things that I look at are the roots and the knowledge and the skills that are necessary. So for the roots, we need to try to attempt to integrate ethics and humanities conduct and, excuse me, content, and you saw there are many things that here at UMKC you are doing. And then also role modeling in terms of mentorship and relationships. And that also then gets carried forward into residency with the uh, competencies and the milestones of the next accreditation system. And then very importantly, and I notice you have four learning communities, professionalism, identity, formation, learning, community, socialization. How do we learn from each other and got, be guided by someone who is a good guide of virtue? But we also have to try to work on, and again, not to do so negatively, but how do we promote affirmatively virtues of altruism of virtuous traits broadly. Because there are times when you will hear medical students get really frustrated or really tired or really inattentive in front of their phones. And you need to try to keep them on task as the person who matters most here is the patient. It's not your phone. It's not a TikTok, TikTok dancing video. It is the patient. We have dissonance of virtue and principle because we have that drilling of that mantra such that people are lightly exposed to virtue. We need to make sure that they understand that their character is something that will be. But each and every patient, the tens of thousands of patients perhaps, over their lifetime, they also need to resist the hidden curriculum sort of the dark side of the force. And I saw lots of dark side of the force type of behavior back in the olden Baden days, uh, DC General Hospital. And here, just sign these uh, uh, prescriptions, but I'm only a medical student. Just do it, that's what we do down here. That kind of stuff. And then we need to have enough people to teach <coughs> and do that role modeling. So this is where the notion of having um, academies of professionalism in each medical school to help preserve the time so that there is self-improvement for your master teachers to do improvement in ethics, humanities, and professionalism, particularly in virtue and care ethics. 
It also means trying to get the gaps covered. So when we're talking about relationships, how are they currently built? How could we make stronger relationships built? How could they be nur nurtured more? In terms of praxis, what kind of humanistic behavior are we calling that behavior? How are the patients seeing that? This is where getting input, 360 evaluations, or even focus, doing what we think we're doing for them. But not only that, for each other. Are we acting as a good safety net for our compatriots, if we're medical students, and for our fellow teachers? And then lastly, how is role modeling being encouraged? I remember when we went to problem-based learning up at uh, University of Michigan many years ago, so this would have been early 1990s, there was almost a pitchfork and flaming torches rebellion by the assistant professor saying, I got to be clinically productive and writing grants. You can't have me have students popping by to do problem-based learning one-on-one -on -one sessions whenever you want and have it not count because I won't be able to get promoted and I'll be gone but you'll have used me. And that's when people who are like, I was an associate professor, well, then we need to do that. It needs to be counted. And actually, that was one of the things that happened at Michigan. We instituted a educational RVU system. And that educational RVU system came out of the clinical dollar side of the balance sheet to help pay for, that's my understanding anyway, that it then paid for teaching. And for those of us like in family medicine, I was teaching in year one, year two, year three, year four, all three years of residency. I was teaching. So when RVU system came into being, all of a sudden my, my salary went crazy. And I was like, I didn't realize doing all that for free, but I'm glad they're also recognizing it. So it helped the people who did not recognize that their time, their effort to change young minds was being valued. So how can I engage others to improve professionalism? Do what you can to try to be a good role model of virtue. I know each and every day I see in the mirror a flaw human being, a fallible human being, as my cognitive therapist mentor once said. And what we do is we do the best we can to improve with what we have, knowing that we're not perfect, but we do the best we can to make things better for others around us. Praise others who demonstrate excellence and character. When you see someone do something well, acknowledge it. Oftentimes, when we are acknowledging the positive rather than getting upset at the negative, even if there is a group of people, if you're acknowledging the positive, the negative will then be tamped down because they see the praise is directed toward the positive. But then otherwise, educate the others, like this one over here, on the nuances of critical thinking. How can we be respectful of others? How can we be better? in terms of being respectful of ourselves? How can we improve? Because the basic job of medicine is the other. It is the patient. And it is the care and nurturing of the medical community around us. Every year on January 1st, as my resolution, be at war with your vices, at peace with your neighbors, and let every new year find you a better person from Benjamin Franklin. And if you have any questions, david.dukas, D-O-U-K-A-S, at tulane.edu. And as we say down in Creole cooking, for a little bit of lanyap, 
This is what the alternative is. Because you can always buy one moral compass for 10, but I'll sell you two for 25. <laughs> On the street corner. On the street corner. So if we do the job better, we don't have these people <laughs> to worry about so much. Thank you very much. Questions or comments? And I'm not sure how we're doing that for Zoom, but if you have someone has a, yes, we have a chat from Joplin or something. It's not one yet, but okay. I'm on it. Okay. Yes. This goes back to my own history as a, as a lawyer. When I came out of school in the 70s and, and joined a, a firm, after a couple of years, I heard these older lawyers complaining about the type of people who were coming out of law school. Mm -hmm. In other words, they were, they were smart enough, but they, they were more interested in money and prestige and, and this and that. And, you know, and looking back on it, there may have been some truth to that. That it was a different kind of person coming out of law school than maybe had come out of it, you know, decades before. So in your career as a medical professor and a medical teacher, have you seen a change in the type of person who is going to medical school, becoming it in terms of their motivation, and is it easier or less easy to develop professionalism now than it was in the old days? Well, I'll tell you the one big change that I've seen, I'll bring this down, is, um, and the, the one major I blanked on at the very beginning was uh, neuroscience, because that's one that I see a lot. I'm on the admissions committee, so I see everything comes in, and I see all the feedback from everybody, and then I'm supposed to render some sort of um, semi-sage-like opinion as to whether someone should go in, uh, into the general pool to be accepted. Um, the one thing that I can say is Back in the good old days, there were more people who were humanities undergraduates or at least humanities double majors. I was one of those. Uh, biology and religious studies. Um, um, you'll see the occasional minor now. You'll see sporadically. Up until pandemic, you used to see like a bunch of like anthropology majors, that sort of thing. And what I've seen is a tremendous amount neuroscience, biology, chemistry, neuroscience, biology, chemistry. And it's just like over and over again. And I'm like, what the heck happened? And it's the counter of what I was telling Brian about when we um, at Tulane first had our um, admissions dean, James A. Knight. Back in 1965, he had the class of 69 that was brought in, and a very large number of those students were um, students with humanities backgrounds. And it was called Knight's Folly, because they, other faculty, thought that they were going to fall right on their face. Whereas, in point in fact, they did something that was very similar to the Mount Sinai program, where they they took a quarter of their class and they said, actually, we don't want you to be pre-meds and you don't need to take the MCATs and we do encourage you to be humanities background. And, and they did as well, if not better. There was small grinding of the gears in terms of the cultural aspects when they came up to these hyper-vigilant, hyper-aggressive pre-meds when they first got there. But they excelled in things like behavioral sciences, family medicine, and psychiatry compared to their peers. And that's contemporaneous. That was done as part of the, uh, the Flexner uh, Centennial Report back in 2010. It was published at that time. So um, my belief is there needs to be there needs to be a greater assurance given to pre-meds that you can take those things that will help you through your life, not just to get into medical school, and that you don't need to only take science majors to do that, 
and that medical schools ought to generally promote that and say, we have a way for you to get through medical school and pay off the debt. Actually, our former medical uh, school student affairs dean had a YouTube video, it's still there, in which it says, look, if you, if you do your due diligence, get into a good job, you're paying off your loans over 10 years, and if you're working for a nonprofit, at the end of the rainbow, at the end of 10 years, you can have the rest of your loan forgiven. I imagine most students didn't know that. But regardless of what your major is, you don't have to be a biology or a chemistry or a neuroscience major to get into medical school and then do those things. You could be in any area of the humanities. And so what we have in our master's program, we have a dual degree program, and we really aggressively go after people who are backgrounded in art or in literature or in philosophy into our dual degree program. But those people are few and far between. And so um, the other thing, too, is the tuition at a private school like Tulane can be intimidating for students. I know it would be for me. Um, so I think that there needs to be a greater assurance. What I always tell students whenever they get concerned about debt is you will always be in debt. You must become more zen-like with your debt. You must become one with your debt. <laughs> Embrace your debt. Know that your little daughter or little son will soon need braces, or you will be paying for a mortgage, gigantic mortgage with God knows what interest rates, and you will have all kinds of other expenses, weddings to pay for. I've had two of those. So all the things. Uh, you'll always have some debt that will be there, uh, you know, this financial monster in the closet, okay? It'll never be gone. So the real question is, can whatever you purchase with that debt be an investment in your future? And if you're a healer, can you be an effective healer with what you've acquired with that debt? and worry about the debt later. Now, things like the loan forgiveness program after 10 years, that, that's an important thing for people to address with their associate deans of student affairs and that sort of thing. But my, my own take is, if we could take money out of the equation, I argued for at the uh, ITME, which was an initiative to transform medical education at the AMA. So I argued for a four-year curriculum in medical ethics and humanities coupled with a CME project to do the same. And then as part of that, there would be a loan repayment program 100% for social service, wherever that could be done, whether it's IHS or uh, public health service, whatever for each and every student who desires it. So that that way, if you're willing to go ahead and serve those who are in underserved areas, they will be able to fully repay that debt with four years of service. That, I think, is a pressure that young learners, because they get very concerned about a $300,000 debt. They're like, how am I ever going to pay that? Mine was a fraction of that. And I went to the most expensive medical school in the country back in 1983 at Georgetown University. The most in the country, because that's what they used to always say, to <laughs> Georgetown froze their tuition for years so they wouldn't be the most expensive <laughs> medical school. It was at my final year, 13500 a year but that's $1983. So you could, you know, 13,500, you can buy an office building back then. So, <laughs> yes. So I'll uh, add to uh, that, that 
relative to UMKC, obviously 70% of our, our uh, students come from high school, so they don't have the opportunity to ha have established a major in the first place. About a third then are coming a traditional four-year route. But one change in medical education that we've adopted here almost a decade ago now is that <clears throat> as we interview students, there are cognitive and non-cognitive uh, factors that we um, automatically formulate into a decision to interview. But when we interview, we interview with, uh, with what's called a multi-mini interview process. And of the 155 medical schools across the country, about uh, 60 of them use this process. And through the process, students enter 10 different stations, and those stations are built to um, test their compassion, their empathy, uh, their virtue. And, and each of those are with different professors within our system, and each of those are graded with uh, uh, on a 10-point scale. So there are 100 points that come into that. And it's different from other medical schools where you might only see two people who interview you who then say, you I choose, um, as opposed to having, uh, you know, 20 or 30 faculty who are involved in the process. So that's something that we do here. Um, is it perfect? Uh, no, because students are so um, savvy and strategic that they, you can go uh, anywhere on Google and download 200 questions that the MMI might ask you. <laughs> but, but, and you can prepare your answers. But that requires that you, I mean, re you really can't pick the two, you know, the 10 questions we're going to ask and we modify those. So that's one way we try to incorporate uh, students who have the need to serve. And as a reflection of that, uh, the U.S. News and World Report, it's not a perfect ranking system, but of the 155 schools across the country, I think we've ranked number 19 in our students serving in underserved areas. So we still have that passion within the School of Medicine, and it may reflect what your mom and dad brought to the school as docents who were those mentors and advisors and role models that we had from the start. And for the BAMD part of it, it starts from the very beginning. So Dr. Bill Ritter here is uh, uh, for 40, 40, 44 years, but he's also an art history uh, master's uh, that he did later in his life. And so as he has our students in the first year and taking them into, before they enter into the traditional curriculum, He's introducing them into the arts, not only to the arts, but also, you know, he's starting his EKG course on Monday. So <laughs> you get the arts and the science from him. But he's just an example of, of what we have at the school that tries to build what Dr. Duke has uh, explained to us today and Correct. building that virtue into you know, where we stand. Now, uh, here's one of the things that I will take from the many good things you're doing, um, whether it's through APHC or whether it's through AAMC. To me, when you are endowed with riches, there is a responsibility to then share them with those who are less enabled. So there are, and when I did the original Prime Project, there were only like between 20 and 30 four-year programs of medical school where they had medical ethics and medical humanities required across the four years. And what I said back then is, it's great to go ahead and say, look at these pillars of virtue, but there's a responsibility embedded in having these outstanding people where, and this is way before Zoom, so this is 2010, you know, that's mm -hmm. quantum time, totally different. I said there ought to be a way for these programs to be able to then promote professionalism through ethics and humanities to the other schools that are less well endowed, where they may have one single person who's supposed to be teaching ethics, much less humanities, for the whole school. And there needs to be some form of 
desire, but I would go stronger mandate from AAMC to do something like that. If we're going to approach this, let's take a John Rawls approach and get everyone up to some sort of a maximum, minimum status of here's what we expect of every and all schools, because there are many schools where they have none of this. Yes? Um, I just wanted to um, make a comment. You talked about the hidden curriculum once mm -hmm. students hit the clinic. Um, but I have been involved in several medical education programs, and I think there's also a hidden, sort of not so hidden, culture within medical schools, even those who provide education in the humanities, and that is that students are um, told in a thousand different ways from the first time they walk in the door that the humanities education that they're getting is not nearly as important as the scientific education that they are getting. Um, and that leads students to the humanities courses that I teach, for example, right. are that they will be easy, that they will be guaranteed an A, um, um, allowed to set their own schedule, for example, right, according right. to what these other demands are. Right. And so I was wondering if you have advice for how to internally evaluate <clears throat> those priorities. Sure. Uh, um, here's one way not to do it, and then I'll t <laughs> give advice on perhaps how to do it. How not to do it, one of my colleagues and mentors, Larry McCullough, ran the medical ethics course at Georgetown. Um, I remember very well because I was very interested in ethics at that uh, young time of my life. And a um, whole lot of people, particularly in the back row, weren't. And they blew it off, and they were told they had to do a blue book exam, and they had to write up a very long essay about a case, et cetera, et cetera. And these people then, to class of 205, turned in their essays. Larry went ahead and dutifully went through each and every one of those essays. And he, now mind you, this is a course that was the last course before clerkship. So there was like a six-week pause. And that was the gatekeeper of whether you're going to go into the third year of medical school. So there were a bunch of the students who just said, I'm blowing this off. Not important. He failed 37 of them and said, by the way, that means you are not departing second year. Welcome to the real world. Everything counts. Being good and kind and truthful is an important virtue, and that means fidelity to the actual investment you owe to each and every patient, to all aspects of your own maturation. Now, rewrite your exam, because otherwise you're not seeing third year. And they did, every single one of them. Wouldn't do that. So, so you're not recommending that. Not recommending that. Students. Don't, don't <laughs> terrorize your students. <laughs> but instead, I, I mean, for instance, I also teach in the Art of Observation course at Tulane. And we take people to the New Orleans Museum of Art. But we also share with them the empirical evidence that shows those people who take that kind of art of observation course have extraordinarily enhanced observational skills in clinical practice. There's a carryover. It's not just in isolation. Oh, I looked at a Mayan piece of pottery today. Isn't that interesting? No, it actually teaches you something about context and color and all the different things about social rank and many, many things that, that go into our discussion. And trying to then connect the dots so that they can understand why something like this is important. Now, you have to remember, <clears throat> and this is why I believe these courses should be required and not elective. I don't know about yours. Ours are elective. So that means we're singing to the choir. We're having people who may have been undergraduate interested in art in some way or could be artists themselves. But if you had somebody who did not ever do it and this was now required, you're now going to have a bit of a buzzkill. 
that there is some instrumental value towards the maturation of that person as a clinician. So you can say, you may not get this now, but when you then first see X and you can identify this clinical syndrome because you're better and more tuned into observational skills, you'll better appreciate why this course was part of what you do as part of the required curriculum. So, and that can be, you know, medical history is the same way. Um, having narrative in medicine the same way, because people need to understand the perspectives and the voice of the patient, but also the voice of physicians, having doctors as authors as uh, to, to empathize what it's like as a healer in the difficult journey they sometimes have to, to navigate. So my way of trying to do it is there is empirical work out there. There's a, actually a medical humanities consortium that helps to, to uh, put out literature in that area to help encourage that by having that given to the students as part of the reading assignment and actually discussing it with them. So, you may wonder why you're taking this. Well, let's talk about why you're taking this. It's not just in isolation. It's because it will teach you to become a better physician and a better professional. Thank you. Other comments or questions for Dr. Dukas? David, thank you. Thank you. Some refreshments outside the door. There you go. Very interesting. Some practicing over the